May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Amen. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in Najib. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping bear the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy carrying their sheaves. Be our light in the darkness, O God, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture is from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, and verses 10 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim claim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland and a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For my message this third week of Advent, I will be focusing on the first three verses of Isaiah chapter 61. Many organizations, businesses, and churches have purpose statements. For instance, our own Congregational Council weighs the decisions that it makes on behalf of this church on whether it will reflect on St. John's purpose statement. Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3 are Jesus' purpose statement. It describes why he exists, his goals, his focus in life. Jesus was in a synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath and had just finished reading from a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. In Luke chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, it states, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Reading the words of prophet Isaiah, Jesus saw that it was about him. He was telling them, this is about me. This is my purpose. For the first part of verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Whenever the Bible uses the words, the Spirit is upon me, there is always an action associated with it. God anointed Jesus for service. The Spirit was upon Jesus, and he had a purpose from God the Father. He was to preach the good news and live it. The gospel was at the center of everything Jesus did and the way he lived his life. The next portion of verse 1 says, He has sent me to bring the good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted. Look at our world today, at our church, at ourselves. There's brokenness everywhere. Jesus was sent to heal the brokenhearted. Using God's good news, it's Jesus' job to mend all of the brokenness and make all of us whole so that there can be joy. In the last portion of verse 1, it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners. Jesus came to set the captives free and to shine the light. The gospel sets people free from darkness 
and from sin. In the second verse, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The year of the Lord's favor is also sometimes referenced, referred to in the Bible as the year of Jubilee. You can refer to Leviticus chapter 25 for a more complete description of what Jubilee entails. But the most important part of what I'm referring to is that during Jubilee, debts were canceled. Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, during which you are in a favorable condition to have your debts forgiven and your sins canceled. This is great news for all of us because we're all sinners. And we have hope because the year of the Lord's favor hasn't ended yet. It's very long, in fact, and it will not end until the second coming of Christ. Jesus also had to be, bring some serious news about the day of vengeance of our God. This favorable time of forgiving our sins is not endless. On the day of vengeance, the believers will find comfort in their faith of Jesus and living in his ways. But for non-believers, it will be a nightmare. Believers will be judged according to Jesus' life reflected in their actions. Non-believers will be judged only by what they have done, and even their works of good will be found filthy. I'm going to refer to the New International Version of the Bible for the next part of the scripture because it gives me a better description of the associated verses. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Jesus came to comfort all who mourn. Jesus came for everyone. No one is excluded. His good news was to comfort all people. Most often we think of death in association with mourning. Scripture tells us that the greatest foe is death. It doesn't have to mean death, though. Mourning comes with the loss of something. It could be a job, a relationship, any kind of loss can cause mourning. Life apart from Christ is death. It is a life of mourning. The gospel transforms our thinking, and we find comfort in the fact that Jesus came to save us. He will bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. I can't imagine you wouldn't find more comfort under a beautiful crown than you would covering your body in ashes and a sackcloth, as was customary during the time of grieving. Being anointed with oil of gladness and adorned by a garment of praise would certainly be more comforting than mourning and a spirit of despair. In the worst possible times of our lives, we don't have to mourn like those who don't have hope. We can have joy. There can be celebration and hope in the midst of despair. The final part of verse 3 says, They will be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord to display his glory. Jesus came to plant righteous trees. In other words, Jesus came to plant the good news in people's lives. He's not going to just plant trees and leave. He's going to give us all that we need to be cared for. He's going to trim us and shape us and guide us through our growth with his care and love. When we're fully grown oaks of righteousness, then it's our job to bring glory to God. How should we respond to these scriptures? John chapter 14, verse 12 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus is not referring to us doing greater miracles than his. He's referring to us continuing to do his good work. We don't have to do better than him, but together we can do more quantity than Jesus could accomplish in even his short years of ministry. When we feel the Holy Spirit stirring in our lives, we need to move to action. We need to pray about it and act on it. Whatever it is in that spirit is moving us to do. If the spirit is alive in someone else and they ask you for help, then go with them. Help them do God's work. We probably have an abundance of opportunities to bind up the brokenhearted, especially during these times of pandemic. There are so many people affected and that they could use our help. Sometimes it's lending an ear to someone who's lonely or depressed. People need to know they're loved and cared for. One of the easiest things you can do for someone is pray for them. Have a simple conversation with God 
on behalf of someone else. If you're struggling with praying, try treating it like God. He's your friend. Have a heartfelt conversation with him. We can help set people free by sharing the gospel. Some of us feel like we need to learn the Bible better. But our own continued learning and growth shouldn't limit us from having conversations about Christ. Just sharing a small portion of what it's like to know God could help shine the light on the path that someone else is having a hard time navigating on their own. Showing them they can rely on God and to trust that he has a plan in place for us and will be freeing them from worry and helping them to know to look to him for strength. Just knowing that our sins are forgiven provides peace. Imagine helping some, to lead someone who doesn't know this amazing truth to God's enlightenment. I pray that Come to the Table and Operation 143 Ministries not only reach the needs of the people of our community, but that it will begin to fill a spiritual need and give people hope. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Not all prayers are answered right away. Sometimes they are granted in tiny pieces. Be still and listen for the messages. Don't be discouraged when you think God hasn't paid attention to your needs. God knows your plan. He has always been and always will be providing for your needs. In all the ways that you can see his blessings in your life, proclaim that good news. Tell people about it. Having been tended to Jesus too by Jesus' care and love, as oaks of righteousness, we should give all the glory to God. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One, strong is your kindness evermore. How you favor the weak and lowly one, humbling the proud of heart. You have cast the mighty down from their thrones and uplifted the humble of heart. You have filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no Peace. 
for peace and salvation we pray to you. For peace between nations, for peace between peoples. For us who are gathered to worship and praise you. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who would, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and bless to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the Spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. 